I think in 2002, no, yes, in 2002, yeah, I remember very well that year because it was the last year I competed in the World Championship. I decided to stop in the way of running the last running the championship, I decided to stop. Yeah, but I remember Marco coming to the team and then, first of all, it was a surprise later on, not this year, obviously, because normally a guy that comes from the north of Europe, you know, no, normally they were not good on tarmac. That's true. And Marco was good on tarmac. Yeah, well, <coughs> not immediately. Not immediately. No, 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 but yeah. Yeah, but it's kind of opposite uh, to you. It was my first full season in the World Trail Championship, so it uh, kind of all started when, when you left. But I think, uh, for me, it was a fantastic year to be in um, a very nice team as M-Sport, and also to have a teammate like um, you and Carlos and uh, Colin and uh, Nicky. And, uh, so it, for me, it was just uh, my childhood uh, sort of uh, heroes. I, I watched on TV before, and then uh, I was in the same team, driving the same car. And, um, you know, it was fantastic to, to see all the different, uh, you know, characters, how they worked and to learn from them. And also, of course, try to beat them and, uh, throughout the year. So it was uh, difficult at, at the beginning, but I think later on I, I managed quite okay. And um, that's why I maybe continued in the M-Sport uh, without the two, uh, two big names uh, the following year. So. But you were so naive when you first arrived, weren't you? I mean, it was so complicated even trying to do your flights and your hotel because... Well, that doesn't change to anything. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> Why was it complicated, John? No, because Estonia wasn't really uh, a big hub then. So there was maybe two or three. No, no change there also. Okay. <laughs> it's even worse now, I think. <laughs> I, I mean, for me, the, the flights are um, you know, quite a big thing in a World Rally Championship that you always spend so much time on planes and yeah. uh, airports and uh, especially if you come from Estonia then you're after a minimum few flights everywhere or probably three and then you know it's difficult you want to um, sort of make the most short uh, connections yeah, well, and, and the, the, the easiest the best uh, event for me with you was Finland <laughs> Yeah, it shows that. Because I could put you on a ferry boat, and yeah. you could go across, yeah. and you were there in two minutes. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that was yeah. Well, in fact, good place to go. Yeah. Finland became one of the because he's one of the few drivers not coming from uh, Scandinavia yeah. that have won Finland. Yeah. In fact, I read just you before we came with him, huh? and you were the second one, I think. No, no, no. second one was Didier. Didier, yeah. Was Didier? Yeah. Didier, because he won there in 1990. Didier won in 1991, I think. Yeah. But that was incredible. Cap. That year, you won Finland. That was unbelievable. The, the amount of people, there must have been 50% of Estonia there. Yeah. Do, you remember yeah, the phone, do you remember the phone call at the end? No, I, I got a phone it. call, and when I looked on my phone, there was a strange number. And it was just when they started doing all the tally sales on the phone. So you were getting these phone calls asking if you wanted to buy this or you wanted to buy that. And this strange voice says, um, I'm the secretary of the president of Estonia. Can I speak to Mr. Martin? And I thought, oh, it's somebody having a joke. Yeah. <laughs> and I said, oh, yeah, I bet you are, I bet you are. <laughs> so I thought, oh, well, I'll give him the phone anyway. At least he can buy whatever they're trying to sell. So I gave you the phone and the look on your face. I'm sure you actually stood to attention while you were talking on the phone. And then I thought, oh, it must have been the president that you were talking to. And I, remember I didn't did, remember that actually. What did Michael, <laughs> do you remember what Michael said to you when you passed the flying finish of the last stage? What was the phrase? It was a famous phrase that was shown no, on I TV. Think it was just um, a comment get, getting back on the fins because they were just um, before the rally running some adverts on TV and they were sort of taking piss out of the foreign drivers. Like uh, it was me, Richard, and Colin, I think, were targeted on those things, so it's oh, three different right. adverts, and then uh, they were just saying that, uh, or more or less trying to say that the foreign drivers have no chance, and they, they are hiding away, they don't really want to compete, or they are afraid to compete there, and I think it's ni nicely 
came back to them because <laughs> that, yeah. that year I think the first spin was like fifth or something like that. <laughs> it, um, it was uh, yeah, but that was just what uh, Pip uh, said at, at the end that uh, kind of not bad for non finish or something like that. No, I mean it, the atmosphere in the service pack and yeah, it was. Yeah, but that, that time it was also good. There was a lot of Estonian <coughs> fans, and yeah. we got uh, Norwegian uh, fans with Petter and, and all over. So there was like a mixture of different uh, big groups, and yeah. uh, they, they had their own, uh, own uh, fight, fight uh, yeah. kind of uh, on, 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 uh, not on stages, but uh, near the stages. So it was always some excitement for them as well. But uh, no, it was a good, good time. But I, I imagine uh, for Louis to, to win it first time with a non uh, Sen name must have been also a very special thing. Yeah? It really special. I mean, my favorite event, when somebody asks me which is my favorite victory, I always say Safari 92. You know, this is a longer story probably because of the, the way the rally was, the strategy and everything. No? If you ask Carlos, Carlos will tell you with no hesitation that the best victory for him is Thousand Lakes. Because to go there, you know, and only Scandinavian drivers won there. And to get there, and such a difficult event, even nowadays, you mm -hmm. know, and the speed that you go there nowadays, I know the professional co-drivers nowadays, they tell me, Louis, luckily we come to Finland only once a year. Because yeah. the speed now, in fact, last year it was one record beaten. To be honest, it's not the, the record I'd like to see beaten, but it was 125 kilometers per hour average the whole event. That was last year, I think. This year, I think it was a bit lower. But the speed in Finland is incredible, and to get there, you know, and to be able to beat the Finns, and particularly for us coming from Spain, which we were never, you know, you had some um, French drivers in the past, Italian drivers from South, Southern Europe, but not from Spain. From Spain, nobody. But you are probably the first one who <coughs> kind of changed that trend. There was a specialist drivers before, like there was mm -hmm. a tarmac specialist, a Scandinavian specialist, and yeah. uh, stuff like that. But probably you and Carlos were there. Because you even used to swap drivers, didn't yeah. you? No, I, I, when, when nominated car, you used to swap it around. With and when we, when we signed a contract with Toyota in 1988, at the end of San Remo Rally, we did a very good San Remo Rally. We got there, and it was. Uh, first it was tarmac, two days of tarmac, and then we were going down, down to the gravel, and we had a Sierra course, which was rear-wheel drive, which on tarmac it was very good, but it was, it, it was dry. But then we got to the rally, and the rally was wet. So again, the four-wheel drive, theoretically, you have nothing to do, but it was very foggy. And then Carlos did a fantastic drive, and we were leading in Torino, with Lancia bases in front of the Lancias. We were leading, first it was ourselves, and then four Lancias behind us. And then we went, and at the end of this rally is when Uwe Anderson called Carlos and said, and it was a very funny story because Carlos had a, a message in reception from Marion Berandeson, the wife of Uwe, saying, Carlos, Uwe wants to speak to you. But Carlos lost the key of the room, so he wouldn't go to reception. So Marion thought they didn't want to speak with him. He didn't want to speak with them. Yeah. And then eventually, like three days later, uh, because that was immediately at this Torino night, and then three days later, Marion sees Carlos in reception, and comes to Carlos, Carlos, sorry, uh, did you see the, the message? What message? We dropped something in reception. Well, I didn't, didn't go to reception because I lost my key and it was always going some other way to Rome. So eventually he managed to meet Uwe Anderson and when he sat with Uwe, Uwe said, Carlos, you know, I've seen the way you drive from Tarmac and I believe you are a specialist from Tarmac, so I would like to, because in those days as we were talking, you know, you, you choose a specialist. And Carlos said to Uwe, even though he had no experience in gravel, not too much, and he said, <coughs> Uwe, I'm better on gravel. <laughs> you know, but that was just a bet, yeah. because you never don't think that I'm just a tarmac driver. I will not be a tarmac driver in my life. And in fact, no, eventually later, he proved he could compete in, in any kind of surface, because nowadays a driver cannot be good in, on tarmac only or on snow, yeah. or you have to be good everywhere, like all but the drivers now. <coughs> but I think you, you more or less started that trend, that mm. you have to be mm. good everywhere. Mm. But I mean, that, that used to be, and still is, the main reason we go testing before Finland. Mm -hmm. If you go testing, you get a test plan for the year, you do a test before the first gravel, then a test before the first tarmac. So you're always testing Finland. And the reason is to get the driver up to speed, not the mm -hmm. car. Mm -hmm. So that when you start the first stage, you're on the same page as the locals. Otherwise, they've gone, mm -hmm. and you're never going to catch them back again. Ah, it was quite, quite common then to do Finland rally, and before this rally, to do Manta oh, rally. Yeah. Yeah. A yeah. small event in Finland to get used to the speed because yeah. it was incredible. You know, it's still nowadays when they are going so fast. Now we go to Estonia now. So yeah, but <laughs> yeah. There, I mean, it's, it's even nowadays. I think it's it's same. It's you know, same. It's 
it's such an incredible speed you, you can carry and you have to carry to be uh, yeah. faster. Uh, even though you, you know it probably takes some time to actually sort of tell yourself that you have to go yeah. more. <laughs> and I uh, think it's not a very comfortable thing to do actually. <laughs> No, when they ask about Finland, I always say, you know, a lot of people speak about Finland, you know, journalists, people from the teams and everything. The only guys that they know what's the speed in a rally car in Finland is the guys that they are inside the car. Yeah. Because it's unreal. You know, you cannot believe that you can go in six gear for so many kilometers, jumping up and down and sliding. And it's completely out of logic, you know, there is no yeah. physical explanation to go that speed. I went last year with Tanak on a pre-event test. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> I've been with actually with quite few uh, top drivers uh, you know, on on the stages, like on touring success. Like I've been with uh, anyway, ma many many drivers, but uh, it's a long time since I've um, been a top car, and uh, the the road was really really fantastic. Uh, I think I never ever tested or driven on such a good road like that one was. Yeah. And I didn't see the road when I was uh, going to the test. I came from a different way, and the first <coughs> run we went through. I, I Honestly, I thought I'm going to have a heart attack. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I was not joking. You know, it yeah. was incredible, uh, the feeling. Uh, and I, I know that when, at the time when I was uh, competing myself, and you went with a top driver, and you sit on a, a passenger seat, I think that's impossible. You know, that the speed yeah. you're doing is impossible. But you know, you could do the same uh, yourself. Yeah. But when you're sitting on it, uh, on the other side, it's um, such a strange uh, sensation. Yeah. And now, after so many years uh, to experience that, I uh, really thought, oh, fuck, I mean, that's I mean, too much, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, the guys now, they do, just talking before, they do two passes, don't they? Yeah. And to get those speeds, years ago, the Scandinavians were so quick because they drove and drove and drove until they memorized the stages. And the poor co-driver was just there as a, a reminder. <laughs> you know, no, when, we, when we were in the team with Michael <coughs> Erickson in Mark Wallen, when we were with Michael Erickson in the team with Clark Bilston, we used to do the recce together the first day, you know, the first first time over the stages, over all the stages, one or twice. So the driver knew which way the road was going. Once they knew that, class was staying in his room, the yeah. whole recce. And Mikkel was was in those days Walkman, you know, with music in the car, and it was always the leading car in front, you know, just to open the road in the road sections so or things like that. But they were, they, they call yeah. it Pekka practice. You know, Pekka is quite quite a famous, a common Finnish name, and they call it Pekka practice, and they used to practice. In fact, some Finnish guy told me that a uh, driver, Kioski Amalainen, some long time ago, I don't know when, he won Finland rally without take notes. Yeah. You know, just from... Mm, just from yeah, that's, that's always... Uh, okay, in Finland it, it can be extreme, uh, but in every way, because the local drivers uh, are well, mm -hmm. you know, only fast on that rally. You know, yeah, you take that's them, true. Uh, to other places, you know, they are nowhere. So it's uh, local knowledge always helps. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think... Uh, now with the two passes, uh, you know, the patience has to be so good that you, you cannot memorize uh, you know, yeah, so, so many really. stages, so many rallies. So it's <coughs> everything has to be done differently. And now I understand uh, all the <laughs> current boys use video so oh, much that uh, all the in car stuff now, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And John, just to one thing that interests me. You know, I was thinking on my way coming here. Sir, I have to ask John. John, you worked since uh, when, when you started in 80, 80 in the World Rally Championship, 80? Well, uh, working, yeah, 86. 86, yeah. And since that, since that day until you retired last year, which driver or which co driver got to you a special impression? Maybe there's more than one or two, I don't know. Um, I think co driver wise, probably Tiziano mm -hmm. was for his era very, very professional. I'm not taking it away from you. No, 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 <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm not taking it away from you at all, Louis. But the level of professionalism he had in his day is now what the co-drivers today have. Mm -hmm. To give you an example, he would finish the recce and he'd come and he'd give me a sheet of all the road section times. He timed every road section. So he knew how much time they'd have mm -hmm. at the end to change tyre, do any work. So it meant that if there was any uh, a problem with the car, then the you could say to the engineer, well, he's going to have five minutes at the end of this road. Yeah, yeah. And to actually do all that extra work, as well as do his notes and everything. Nowadays, you get that from the co-drivers. 
Uh, but in his era, he was the only one that did it. But he was always so quiet and reserved and in the background, but such a professional guy. Not taking it away from any of the others. No, no. I would say I can't think of a bad co-driver. Driver-wise, I have to say, and again, sorry. <laughs> Again, Carlos is the same ethos. Mm. He was so professional before the likes of when Marco came along, you were at the same level. But Carlos was that professional years before. Remember you, uh, he came into service. If you wanted to find him, he was around the back of the truck having a, one of those cigarettes. So that was his training. Mm. Uh, Carlos will be out running or doing something similar. Well, no, I the one thing with Carlos, I will say to him, he was a demanding person, but everything he asked for made the car go quicker mm -hmm. or the team work better. To the point that <clears throat> I used to get phone calls on a Sunday afternoon, and my wife would answer the phone, it's Carlos, I've just been thinking, if we change this or we move that or we do something, then that will improve things. And obviously it comes to him at the spur of the moment. And I used to get such a lot of grief off my wife, you know, why are you getting these phone calls on a Sunday? So the end of the year when we had our Christmas party at Camp Sport, I thought, right, I'll introduce my wife to Carlos. So I said to Pauline, this is Carlos, this is the man that rings me every Sunday. <laughs> now tell him what you've been telling me. And she looked at him and looked into his eyes and said, Oh, it's okay, you can ring whenever you want. <laughs> Around no, no, table. but I have to say that when they ask me, you know, about the best drivers in the history, you know, Sebastian Lox, Sebastian Ojek, uh, whatever, and for me, well, obviously being with Carlos for 15 years, but for me, it's Carlos because of what you said, because for me, there is a, the history of, ra of rallying has changed when Carlos arrived into the World Rally Championship. You know, we were the first ones doing physical training, nobody yeah. did fitness, and we, were, we used to go jogging every day. Uh, at the end of the race, you know, after 10 hours in the car, go out jogging, which is not the thing you really want to do. But we felt we had to do it, and with Carlos, I have to say that I learned so much, and been, I will be all my life so grateful to Carlos. The, the year um, the, uh, 2004 was good, because then we uh, had another side, we had uh, Colin, who was very opposite to Carlos, <laughs> uh, didn't put almost any effort in, uh, in my opinion. So, But okay, he had the talent, and he had uh, good uh, sides as well, so I think uh, for me it was nice to observe. Yeah. one and the other and try to pick something from there and try to pick something from there and try to mix it together and make it work for myself so I think it was a, a really fantastic opportunity to see like a top top sportsman top uh, professionals uh, working and be so close uh, so I, I, I think I, I could I could definitely learn a lot from, from Carlos as well. Yeah, I remember with Carlos and William and Sean Carlos and Colin that we were together and Colin was not famous for being most heavy worker but at the end, we always use the same suspension in every single rally, which that helps a lot the team, when you don't need to start changing mm. things up and down. Colin and Carlos would always have the same. In fact, I'm lying, because only in Wales Rally GB, in those days, I remember on the dampers, we had a 420, 220, and Colin had 400, 200, just a little bit softer. But that was the only change throughout the whole season. Roll bar, suspension, it was identical. But for example, with Didier, we were in the same team. On tarmac, we were identical, and on gravel, completely opposite. You couldn't compare the cars. different driving. Yeah, and you, can yeah. for example, sometimes he was talking, <coughs> and the, the team would ask you, you, how would you like the car? And I said, what has Carlos done? He said, okay, put it like Carlos done. Yeah. I was just going to say that yeah. when I observed, there was a two um, ways of, of seeing that um, the setup was the same. One, uh, Colin didn't really care and took what Carlos uh, <laughs> yeah. decided after yeah. a long test. Uh, or Carlos uh, was not sure and uh, wanted to take the one uh, Colin had. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah but Colin, Colin was, some people think he was not, and he was a very, very good test driver. Yeah. And he immediately, you know, both would start on different days, different tests, you know, and we'll, they'll end up in the same thing. Yeah. Obviously, Carlos then will ask, what is Colin using? Colin will ask, what Carlos use? Well, normally, what you're doing on the team, you know, you always want to know what the team the member team is doing. Team doing, doing but it was, Colin was a very, very good test driver. Yeah, yeah no, he had very good technical uh, mm -hmm. understanding, and uh, you know, but he, he probably came to the conclusion quicker what he wanted than Carlos. Carlos, it took like the whole day and uh, half of the night yeah. to, <laughs> to, to decide and, and what he wanted. Yeah, but I remember, for example, David Lapworth saying once to me, 
you know, Luis, if I want to develop a cap, I will tell Colin to start with and Carlos to do the end. Because mm -hmm. Carlos will never stop trying to find the last bit, you know, something. Mm -hmm. He always thought the cat would be better. Even if we were winning yeah. the rally, he was already thinking, and at the end of every rally, we were making a list of things to improve, how to do this, how to do that. Yeah. Even if the car was perfect and we were winning stages and winning rallies, he would still think, I'm sure I can do better than this. And I remember at the test, I observed sometimes that, the, that Carlos stayed in a car between the changes, you know, quite often, like a long, uh, like a fifth change or something like that, and he stayed in a car. Even though it was increased, like a 35 degrees or whatever, yeah. Yeah, it, it, most of the time you stayed in a car and waited until it was changed and then you continued driving. Yeah, for me it was quite... But uh, that there was a reason for that. And the reason said, Luis, when I make important change, I don't want to move my position at all. Uh -huh, so then when yeah. I get back in the car again, I know <coughs> that I'm exactly in the same position, I know exactly what I'm doing. And because it was, you know, sometimes in the teams at the beginning, always with the engineer, the first test with an engineer, it was never easy. Because Carlos would tell me, as an engineer, nobody comes and says, well, the paper says this, or the computer says that. At the beginning was papers, later was computers. And then Carlos said, yeah, but my feeling is different. But until the engineer realized how good mm. Carlos was testing, because for me, he was the best, best driver. I mean, wherever he was, either we won the championship or the team won the championship somehow. You know, he, he, even in Dakar, when he went to Volkswagen, you know, and when they choose Carlos to develop the Polo. I think in that respect, that's why I always say that to me, obviously, it was with him for 15 years, but yeah. There is an, a time before and after Carlos in the World of the Championship. Even though some drivers have won more than him, but I still believe that he was he made a big difference. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I'm sure he was the hardest working driver. Yeah. I don't know he anybody was, else. Uh, and he was very hard to work for, but you knew at the end. You tell me. No, no, <laughs> I know. <laughs> but you knew at the end yeah. he was working in the same direction to get the same result. Mm -hmm. It's like I was saying before, you, uh, you always remember when you used to go to New Zealand because it was a 12 hour time difference. Carlos used to do it half. He used to do a six hour time difference. So he used to get up at some crazy time, like three o'clock in the morning, and go to bed at some six o'clock in the evening so that he didn't have to change his body clock. No, no not so early, not so early. He didn't wake up so early. I used to wake up very early because he yeah. used to go jogging in the morning. Say when I was there, sometimes you jog in the morning because you wake up early, but sometimes you were doing it in the evening. But not so early, but definitely, you know, he would try yeah. to do anything. I remember once he landed in New Zealand, and that day he was landing at five in the morning, typical time that you land in New Zealand. And he was in the hotel and he woke up at three to go to the gym, because, you know, you're awake. Yeah. Anyway, I went to bed at seven, let's say, or eight, at dinner in my room. And Carlos was flying all the way from Europe, eh? 36 hours flight or whatever. I went to the airport, I picked him up, went to the hotel, went in, took a shower, then I drove 200 kilometers in New Zealand, Carlos was sitting on the right seat because we had to test that day. And at nine in the morning we were testing already. After coming the whole way, and he said, Carlos, don't tell me that you're not tired. Well, it's not so much. I mean, the flight is long, but it's quite comfortable in the plane, and I cannot wait to sit in the car. You know, for him, yeah, and, and, the enthusiasm. and in the flight, you know, he was already thinking <coughs> and engineering and what to tell and what to do and how to do it. and. Uh, I mean, I, I remember a lot of um, young drivers in Spain saying, mm. Luis, we would like to go and see you in a rally and this, you know, to, to see how we can improve and this. And I said, don't come to a rally, that's easy. You know, it's enjoyable, it's nice, you see champagne in the podium. Go to see a test, how yeah, you have to yeah. test, you know, what Marco was saying. You're inside yeah, the car you have to do the work. and you are working, working, yeah. because you all guys, you know, you have a natural talent. You know, I can improve my driving if you coach me a little bit, I can improve, but I will never be competitive. You know, that's normal. But what is not normal is to have this capacity of work. You know, if you add yeah. these two things, the talent and a lot of work, you get success or at least never regret anything. Because you go to bed knowing that you give, mm. they gave everything you had. And it was Carlos, the regret never existed. Because you worked hard, had a lot of talent, and then the result comes there. And at least don't regret anything. Mm. Yeah, true. But every year it's been more and more important. That Right. Yeah, but, but sometimes you have to give a driver an incentive to get a good result. <laughs> Remember Sweden when I uh, bet you before the final stage whether you'll be fastest or not? You won't remember, but yeah, I no, did. no, I remember that one because and, uh, uh, you lost money there. I put money off uh, <laughs> Millie. You don't get that very often. <laughs> so it's definitely. Fair. And uh, as soon as you clear the stage, beef comes straight on the radio. There's the stage time. That's. I forget what it was, 50 yeah. euros or whatever it was. That's 50 euros you owe. Yeah. <laughs> and of course, the press got hold of this. So I rung my wife that night. As soon as I said, hello, how are you doing? 
What's this? You've lost 50 years. <laughs> <That's all. laughs> yeah, that's so worth the. Um, yeah, you've probably, you've probably got that framed, haven't you? <laughs> that was the first and last time I ever bet anybody. So. Yeah, and the very first and last time you had to give money out. I know, so you're unique in that, Mark. <laughs> I've actually I've given you money. <laughs> Which yeah, is not yeah. something I do often. I know that. But uh, I think the way you have run the M Sports has been a great uh, example of how to do good business, I think. Uh, it could have, a bit like Carlos, it could have improved. But yeah, but uh, if you ask me, I, I, I'm sure at the time I didn't like it, but uh, yeah. you know, looking back and uh, actually learning from it, and, uh, and uh, you can actually use that same sort of. Um, approach in every, every business and it's, it's not bad. It, I it have makes to say sense. that was one of the, uh, use the term proudest, things you ever said to me was about a year after you started running your own team, you came up to me on one rally and said, now I understand why you used to do this, this and this. Now I'm running the team, I can see why you had to do all these yeah. particular things. Yeah, it's a bit more, Sometimes more easy to understand, them, but yeah. I think it was a good good experience I had actually that um, I could uh, transform that into my own <laughs> ac activity so I think it was yeah. also good good to see it uh, how it's done by a professional and uh, try to do something similar and I think uh, if you look at M Sport at the moment uh, that Malcolm has taken it to yeah. incredible you know it's a small private business and uh, you know I'm sure that a lot has, has to do with the way you, you run the um, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, there. yeah, we started John, in '96. We were mentioning that before. Yeah. In '96, we started with um, we had signed a contract with Toyota. With Toyota, Toyota was banned, so we had to went with to Malcolm. And Malcolm was starting his M Sports his uh, from his van, from his stables at his yeah. house. Yeah. It was a very small thing. I, I don't know, maybe 30 people working, not more. And now you have John what? 250. And it's increasing for it's increasing to about 450 next year when we get the new building. Building a new building, but the new building, the other one will remain. Yep. And the new one is just for is, is it's running for or is no, friendly no, or for it's for a uh, new car development and assessment. Mm -hmm. What's happening is that car manufacturers now find it so difficult to uh, develop these hybrid cars and sports models, etc. That it's much easier to give it to a private company. Mm -hmm. The idea was started at ProDrive with Dave Richards mm -hmm. when he developed the STI Subaru. He did all the development work and then Subaru marketed the car. So the idea Malcolm's got is to do something similar. And we've already done a couple of projects within our main building, but the idea is to have a separate building that's A, secure, and B, it's private, and they can do all the work, all the car can be developed, then you give it back to the manufacturer and he either produces it or we would be in a position to produce low volume examples mm -hmm. of that car. Um, we're doing something similar already with, uh, strangely enough, a transit van. Mm -hmm. There's an M Sport transit van and that has proved to be very, very successful. Uh, you wouldn't think it, but it's amazing how many builders and plumbers want an M Sport transit van. So, but I think one thing when they need to be done there is they need but to do it. It's the one, it's the man at the top that's is yeah. the brains behind it, as you said. You know, when we started with Carlos, as I said to you before, it didn't matter what contract you had, what document you had, you had the most important thing, and that was Malcolm's handshake. Mm -hmm. And he's such a man of honour and so proud of what he has achieved. If he shakes your hand, then he's a man of No, and I, I know Malcolm. I, I never seen. I don't think I met anyone in my life that works harder than Malcolm Williams. No. Never. And luckily, you know, he's surrounded by a fantastic lady. You know, Elaine. Ah, that's true. Uh, absolutely great lady. Yeah. But the only thing they, what they need there, John, somehow, if Malcolm said that they are thinking in Carlisle, because to get to Cockermouth, you need to fly to either Manchester or, or Liverpool. Yep. Yeah. And it's an hour, 45 minutes, right? Yeah. But I think they are trying to rehabilitate this airport at Skyline. Yeah, that will help a lot. Uh, it will be open next year. Yeah? Yes. But only a very small regional airport. But mm -hmm. uh, it will be open. It will make a difference. Mm. Uh, luckily, it's being done by Stobbers. 
mm -hmm. who are a long-time friends of Malcolm and b long-time supporters and sponsors of mm -hmm. uh, Matthew. Mm -hmm. So um, hopefully, once they get that up and running, then we should be able to link into that, mm -hmm. which will make a massive difference. If they're oh, leaving sure. at four o'clock in the morning, we can leave at six o'clock, which is ended on the street. As you about. know, two hours in bed is worth a fortune. Yeah, yeah. Then they will not speak about uh, Millie Tours. Well, but that year <laughs> when you... Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but the ultimate one of those was coming back from Turkey when they uh, had the um, uh, asked out from Iceland. Yeah. They grounded all the flights. And we had to rent two coaches and set off and drive overland from Turkey all the way back to Kala, uh, to Kokomo. And was it cheaper? Because if it was cheaper, you would no, oh, you will be so happy. Cheap. Unfortunately, it wasn't cheaper, Lewis. Which I'm sure you save a lot of money to the team. No, thing. no, you know why we lost out so much? It no. took us four days, so that's four days' day money I had to pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> four days to drive back. Yeah. 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 And uh, as yeah. we were saying the other night, um, we set off, went over the Turkish border into Bulgaria, Romania. We've been going about 25, 26 hours, and we've taken food on the coaches, plus lots of alcohol to <laughs> help the journey. <laughs> and somebody <laughs> spotted the McDonald's, and all of a sudden, there's a McDonald's, a McDonald's, and both coaches turned around, went into this McDonald's, and they must have thought it was Christmas. <laughs> so 60 people came in ordering Big Macs because you didn't have to speak the language, you could point at the pictures. <laughs> <laughs> Paying for it with these foreign credit cards, so. We all had a food, got back on the coach. A day later, we were going through Germany, and we saw another McDonald's. We all piled into there for another meal, and in Germany, they wouldn't take the credit card. So <laughs> they would only take cash. So, in the, what you would consider... There you go, John Payne. Mm. So, we ended up that way, but yeah. But that was the ultimate in Millie Tour. Yeah. <laughs> was, was, that, was that the biggest, biggest challenge for you as a coordinator to uh, that was one of them. I think the other one was um, getting the trucks and stuff into Cyprus when the uh, railroad broke down. We Cyprus or Jordan? No, Jordan. There was something that broke in, jo in Jordan. In Jordan, the problem was getting through Israel. Mm. So in other words, everything was there. So but was that bro broke as well one year? It yeah, in Jordan, I think the rally was cancelled, shortened by a day. Yeah, yeah. By in a Cyprus, day. no. Yeah. Cyprus, it wasn't. But we went to the harbour to collect the cars. Yeah. But Which we year was that? 2001 um, or 2002. Like that, yeah. But I remember, we um, were all running around trying to rent cars to wrecky cars. Yep. We had to use um, <coughs> yeah, local but rental cars. At the end, we, we got the cars. You got the cars, but right just uh, your stuff was late, or everybody. No, everybody. No, no, everybody, uh, the whole boat, and we were all the teams, you know, waiting for the car, waiting for the bus. Yeah. And in fact, the day we were starting, we were supposed to start the recce, instead of starting at 7 in the morning, I think we started maybe at midday, at 12 or something yeah. like that, because oh, we yeah. had to go yeah. to the yeah. harbour, yeah. and then the boat opened, the ferry boat, and we waited for the cars outside, and the mechanics did prepare a little bit, and so we would go yeah. in and start wrecking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But those, those are the things that, like, the, the biggest challenge, because it affects the whole team. Mm. Other things, smaller things, um, you can actually uh, find a solution to or find a way around. Um, first time we went to Argentina, we took all the transmissions as hand carry and they lost them. Very convenient, very practical. Very, very, very practical, yeah. <laughs> now, this is the day when you could take a 65 kilo gearbox as hand uh, as uh, hold luggage, not hand carry. Oh, okay. <laughs> to hold luggage. So we had six or seven of these, plus the discs and everything else, and they managed to lose them between Manchester and London. So when we got to London, to get on the flight to go to Buenos Aires, they'd lost them. So I ended up staying in London, waiting while we found these things. So eventually we located them, got them to London, so the next day I had to set up and fly with all this luggage, and just me on myself. So. When I got to Buenos Aires, I physically couldn't lift all the luggage off the carousel <laughs> and get it to the internal flight, so I had to get a load of local people to come and help me move it all across. So we got on the local flight up to Cordoba and filled the luggage hold with all our stuff. So there's about three or four people on the flight, plus me and all these transmissions and bags and you know, 
But with that sort of instance, it only affects me in the main. The, the other things affect the whole team, and that goes with the more bigger Yeah, challenges. because also, you know, when you have these logistics, because I was working uh, for driver normally, then I was helping organizing, but yeah. I was ambassador in Jordan Valley, and I was helping. And then you start to learn other things that you haven't thought about before. And you start to think, and you start to get, get to the logistics, which is things that now in Volkswagen I explain to the people that come with us, how complicated is the logistics of the World Rally Championship. Yeah. Because, for example, in Formula One, they fly from a circuit to the next one. Yeah, they fly everything. In, but we send in one plane, yeah. all together. Yeah. Yeah, but we send a, a boat that leaves in February with equipment, with 100 tons of equipment, we have eight containers that goes to Mexico, Argentina, and China, but it leaves on February with what you're going to use in Australia in November. Yeah. So the, 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 yeah. Yeah, you, you're planning. Obviously, we have a smaller kit. We have, I think, we fly 16 tons, plus the rally cars that we fly them all with. Yeah. But you fly 16 tons in a plane. But obviously, if you want to put more things in a plane, it costs more money. Yeah. And we want to save, uh, you know, at least not to save, but not to increase the costs. You know, that's the, the target nowadays. You just try to be sensible because yeah. our sport is very expensive. But the logistics, and for example, John, and you know better than anybody else, to make a calendar for the World of the Championship. It takes six months Easily. when you try to put things in place yeah. and then once you think it's done you say ah but if we leave it like this and then they say oh it's the formula one it's the weekend yeah yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> or we can't get the service part that weekend or there's a local fair or something like this it it, it is a difficult thing but the, the sooner they start working with the calendar the easier it is then to sort mm. of try and get your planning mm. but then if you take this year's calendar Okay, we lost China, but now you've got three events in one month. Yeah, yeah. You know, so at the moment it, it, it's very, very difficult to get everything in place to try and get everything to work so that you don't end up by a GB rally, the end one, with something missing or a car not in the right place. Because like when that. you think about, you know, John and Marco drivers, you know, you normally do a rally, then you play home immediately. But then when you have to stay there, like when I was in Subaru, a sporting day, you know, I started to see how they have to put everything down, take everything down. But then there are guys that they are driving track, tractors. Yeah, yeah. And now the guys that they are driving tracks, these three, these months with his rally, yeah. they will probably not spend one single day at home. Correct. Because they are driving from here to there, so we did a calendar. Everything looks good for everybody. Yeah. But there are some guys that you don't see the family for a month, if they are lucky. And they are driving up and down. And I mean, the one thing I realized that when you're a driver, you think, uh, so difficult and tough and you know uh, busy <laughs> and this and that but actually when you stop that and uh, try to do some normal uh, life activities <laughs> and, and uh, work or whatever then you realize what busy is actually <laughs> being, a, being a top level uh, rally driver is you know, it's, it's a different uh, type of busy yeah, but, uh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's more like the pressure I think you get that mm -hmm. from, like a mental pressure and, and the but traveling wh but which was your best event in your opinion the one you did, uh, result-wise, mm -hmm. well, for you, because I think the good ones are always necessary. Uh, Sweden, uh, Sweden and yeah. New Zealand are always really good, fun places yeah. to go. I mean, mm -hmm. some of the rallies are really pain in the ass to, to, to really <laughs> compete, yeah. but those are always fun. I think never yeah. mind the results, but you had fun. Th there. Those are the ones you look forward to doing the most. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, Finland, uh, as we spoke before, was. All is special, but it was like a little bit too much. Like it was yeah. Yeah. better to too much to, to enjoy it after you know, done it. Like <laughs> your own in Bohemia stage, a fantastic stage, but when you cross the finish line, then it's like <gasps> yeah, I didn't get, <laughs> yes. get, uh, get the pressure off. So it's yeah. uh, different. You know, it's it's uh, fun, and, but it's not so enjoyable. Then uh, you know, like New Zealand is a fantastic place. Uh, I was yeah. this year with an uh, old uh, escort, and uh, no, oh, it was the best fun ever. Go there again. Yeah, I wish I would. It, it is brilliant stage. It really, really is. It's just a shame. Well, yeah. it, this is yeah. running paradise. You know, it's uh, uh, absolutely. Yeah. There's no better place in the world. It's rather that the driver does need to look look to the nose of the car to avoid their foul, like in Greece or Cyprus. Mm. Yeah. They don't misunderstand me. They have their own character. Eh? It's yeah. nothing new. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. New Zealand. Be the landscape is beautiful, the, the stages, you know, you have everything, fast, slow. I mean, for me, I mean, for example, I think Wanga Coast, I'm sure you remember Wanga yeah. Coast. I think if you ask people that have driven this stage in their lives, and you ask these people, which is the nicest stage ever in the history of rallying? To me, it's Wanga Coast. Because of the scenery, if you go along <coughs> the coast, because it's 30 kilometers long, 15 very slow, 15 very fast, 
you have everything, you know, it's a beautiful area. Raglan is a small town next to it, which is really yeah. a nice, you know, surfing place and beautiful. Really nice. I, I think there's no bad place in New Zealand. No, <laughs> probably not. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. only good or very good. Remember doing yeah. the uh, Motu Road? Yes. Yeah. 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 That was always Colin's yeah. uh, favourite stage. Mm. That was always the one where he used to make the big push to mm. try and get it. It was 44 kilometres long, and I think Something the, like that, the yeah. time in the stage was. 39 minutes or 40 minutes. It was almost not like Cyprus because Cyprus, <coughs> the average of the rally in Cyprus was just over 60 kilometers yeah. in the, uh, an hour at the end of the rally. Uh, Comparing to Finland. One of the rallies I, I, I could not enjoy at all. It's yeah. so boring. It's so yeah. same, you know, second gear going to third gear, second gear, yeah. third gear. It's like no, no fun at all. I remember when we won there with, with you, we fought yeah. in 2001. We won the rally and we got there and we did some good testing and Carlos was really pleased with the car and I said, Luis, I think here we can do. And we started and Carlos was driving in a different st normal style that he normally drives. Yeah, He was using, not changing because he was going always in slow corners and tried to all, always long gear, you know, and going out of the corner and immediately <coughs> changing, changing, not to slide. And Colin, with people spectating, was saying, Colin is going all over the place. And even at the end of the stages, once over the radio, Nicky was really not so to complaining, but he couldn't understand. He said, what's yeah, going yeah. on with that? You, you have yeah. to go slow to be fast. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And then you felt, you know, it looks like it was not going fast, but the times were really, I mean, the first day, I think we took one minute over everybody. You were the and first one to click what, what was needed there. Yeah. 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 yeah, because it was the first year there, and I think we caught everyone by surprise. Yeah. Then second year was not the same. That, that year was incredible. I know it was the one event where if your power steering went, that was it. Mm. Oh, you, you get the driver yeah. at the end was absolutely impossible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I think I even remember it was a Doriel one year with the yeah. Seat, yeah, <coughs> the long stage without it, and then yeah. at the finish it just yeah. collapsed yeah. out yeah. of yeah. the yeah. car. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> True. Yeah, he was yeah. a strong man to actually finish the stage. Yeah. Mm. But remember when we used to send text messages to the car? Yeah. We used to send like the splits yeah, yeah, and yeah. stuff. <coughs> remember we used to send beef the football results? He was football mad, yeah. and he used to want the football results. So we used to send him the results through on the on the screen, that, and all the journalists used to think it was some kind of code mm -hmm. or some tactic or something like that. The only thing I remember the message is that uh, I think it was the year we won um, Corsica. <coughs> we were having a battle with uh, Tuval in the same team, uh, and it was on Sunday. Uh, one of the first stages, and we are going through the stage, uh, yeah. Uh, and suddenly there's a message coming like MM engine failure. I'm thinking, like, what do they know something we don't know? Yeah. <laughs> Everything seems okay. And yeah. and then uh, ah. just after we passed Francois, who had stopped on the uh, stage with engine failure, and you meant uh, SD uh, yeah. engine failure, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you were MM, and I was like, what? <laughs> yeah, <I don't> <laughs> <know>. <laughs> what are you on about? You know, it's <laughs> our engine is fine, yeah. <laughs> Finger problem. <laughs> I think That's the first day. Too enthusiastic to do it. John, I'm very, very disappointed now. Well, we always thought you never made a mistake. Oh, for me, when it was working, you know, honestly, when it was yeah. working in the team with John, I mean, in general, <coughs> all the coordinators from all the teams, they are really professional, you know. But for a co-driver, it's, it's uh, such a relief, you know, when you know you phone John and you have a problem or you want to know something, something about the rules because you're stressed, you don't remember, and you phone and you always get the right answer. And sometimes that's annoying. <laughs> no, you can, it cannot be right all the time. So I'm happy to hear that, Mark. When I no, 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 I have another one. Yeah. Actually, go on, I don't remember which rally it was. Uh, it was the Sardinia. We were going to the <coughs> takedown, <coughs> and somehow the four team uh, ended up going like two hours before everybody ah, else, or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Which I, I don't really like because I, I, yeah. I don't like early mornings. So <laughs> and everybody <laughs> waiting like <laughs> on the side of the road. So it, <laughs> it, no was it was dark. Yeah, it's, it's, it's yeah. crazy. Yeah. I, I don't remember the details, but I remember it like way well too early. Well, I planned this thing to, to get everybody because you had to move the service. I think you're up to the top of the mountain yeah. for the shakedown, you see. And I got it all planned. And I got up that morning. I was like, yeah, I said, okay, we'll be all right. Yeah. And gets up there, and I'm thinking, it's seven o'clock. It doesn't start till nine o'clock, and it took me by surprise. Why I got the two hours wrong, I haven't a clue. Mm. And Malcolm comes and says, uh, "What's everybody doing up here at seven o'clock?" <laughs> <laughs> I think I made a mistake. You know, I wanted to come on time. Right. I wanted to. He was says, uh, "You've made it now. You do not make it again." Because <laughs> he, he was like, "You, he hates getting up at four. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
but on GB one said, um, be because you're always travelling, of course your clock is set on a different time, and I forget what my alarm clock was set at, it was on a different time scale, like two hours. So I'd gone to bed, set it, and of course it went off. Oh, hell, gets up, gets dressed, jumps outside, gets in the car, and it's quiet, there's nobody else around mm -hmm. here, and then I look, and it was two hours early. <laughs> because he can't go back to sleep, they can <laughs> I have to go and have a long breakfast. Luckily, that but was only me. <laughs> but those days, you no, know, at right the very beginning, years. because the rallies, people say, we spoke about it before, you know, they were better before, they say, Louis, the rallies were better before. No, they were not better. They were just different. Different, they yeah. Were different. I mean, yeah. we didn't sleep, and that probably, because sometimes you could make mistakes, because I remember Wales Rally GB, you know, in 88, it was like five days rally, and you slept the first day maybe five hours, and then four, three, two, and you were sleeping, and you were always, always tired all the time in the road sections, falling asleep, I mean, it was a, sometimes in some rallies it was difficult to keep the driver awake. First you had to try to be awake yourself, yeah. but trying to keep the driver awake because once you get to the stage you were driving fast and then you were awake, you know, adrenaline, but then as soon as you finish the stage, oh. once again, you know what happened with the team all the in Subaru when we were in Spain, in Rally Spain, we were in the same team with Carlos, and then on the second, on the Saturday, there was one stage to go at night, and um, Eventually, we were leading the rally, Colin was second, and the third guy, which I don't know who he was, was already far behind, more than a minute or something like that. So David Richards called both drivers, Carlos and Colin, and said to Carlos and Colin, OK, guys, battle is stopped now, you know, he orders now, we want you to win, we don't want to make a mess, we don't want someone to have an accident, so you have to slow down. So they came out of the room, and then Carlos told me, Luis, this is what David told me. And then Carlos, and what did you say? I didn't say anything to David. But I went to Colin, and I said to Colin, Colin, don't even think about team orders. You're doing a fantastic event, the same as me, and we should fight between each other. Forget about the team orders. So then we went to the next stage, and it was a night stage, and I remember very well at the stage, because we beat Colin by three seconds. And obviously, the guys behind me were far behind. So David realized that we didn't pay attention to the team orders. <laughs> and then we went back to the service park, and then David was very upset really upset and he started to shout to both of them and said this is you are being stupid this is not the way i told you to go slowly you know we're here fighting for a company for sure who want to win the rally first and second so now end of the story i want you to go slowly, slowly. so carlos came to me and said luis i said carlos if he's telling you this and we have to slow down obviously you slow down but you keep the speed a bit high you know to keep the concentration or whatever but then the following day we started and then calling took i don't know two or three seconds the difference, and then Carlos said, Luis, and we couldn't speak with him. You know, he was trying to avoid us on the road section, and Car Carlos said, Luis, what you do? I said, Carlos, I mean, we cannot risk an accident. You know, David Richards mm -hmm. told us that, we cannot risk an accident. So eventually <coughs> we finished the rally, and Colin overtook us. And in fact, in one of the stages, you can see, I think it was uh, John Spiller and Nigel Riddle, they were on the middle of the stage trying to stop Colin, and Colin didn't stop. So we finished the rally, and when we finished the rally, you know, Colin has won, but he forced him to take a penalty the time control, because even though it was one minute per minute, but we still be first and second, Colin was not very happy, and he was even more disappointed, because I had a fantastic relationship with Colin, really great, and then because I had so much friendship with Colin, I went to speak with Colin after the rally, and he said, Colin, I'm really disappointed with you, because Carlos was very honest to you, was a real man when he said to you, Colin, don't think about the models, we do it like that. So then we went home and then, you know, I thought I lost Colin, which was a real shame for me because I really love Colin. Mm -hmm. And then eventually, I mean, next rally is Wales Rally GB, and I'm in my room working <coughs> in the notes and cleaning, and someone comes and knocks on the door. And I open the door, and it's Colin. And Colin came and said, Luis, can I give you a hug? I want to excuse myself for what it is. I want to start with you, and then I will speak with Carlos. And he came on tears, and I was on tears as well. We both had each other, and if we were good friends before, even better friends after. You know, and I think you have to see the both sides. You know, Carlos, the way, you know, like a real gentleman, and Colin, a guy that is a, a potential winner of anything, but he can still say, excuse me, mm. pardon, you know, sorry to do that, you know? And for me, those good things, and, and that's the story how it went. I'm not saying anything because they asked me 15 years ago, and I said exactly the same way as it is now. That's how the story was. And I think now team orders, I understand, the, is not, you know, you like to have them. And for example, in Volkswagen now, since we were with Josh Capito, now we have Sven Smets as the team principal, but they, they will never exist. You know, at this moment, they said never. Team orders. Obviously, I think if you get to the end of the season, last rally, 
And uh, for example, Ogier to win the championship needs to win the rally. And Yarimati Larval is in front of him, it will be stupid not to tell him to slow down. Yeah, it always depends mm. what the exactly. situation uh, is. You can't but, say never. But the philosophy of uh, Volkswagen now is no tomorrow whatsoever. Right. It's very good that they can have that philosophy. No. Very good. Because you remember Cropley, similar mm. thing when we had the focuses. Um, you'd done three days and then you sat down with Malcolm, and I think it was Joss again that night, and it, it was decided between yourself and Colin that you would hold position, and then of course the next day, unfortunately, Colin started going quicker and quicker, and Malcolm and Joss had to go out to try and slow him down on the road section and explain to him that you'd made an agreement, you'd shook hands on it, but what you didn't know was Petter Solberg was also running with us, and he had a much better position on the road. If you remember the Cropley, oh, yeah. uh, if you were high up on the road, huge difference, massive disadvantage. So he's running like car 15 with Phil Mills, and he keeps banging in fastest stage times. And Malcolm keeps saying to him, you have to slow down, I don't want you to crash, I don't want you to damage the car, but of course the times were coming partly because of his road position. So while all this was going on with you guys at the front, poor Petty was trying, coming back saying, I'm slowing down, I'm slowing down, but he was still putting fastest stage times. So when he came to service, he brought his car into service, he went and hid behind the service truck so he didn't bump into Malcolm because of what had happened with his stage time, which nobody had noticed because they were so busy with you two guys. Mm -hmm. No, there were plenty of stories. I remember once with Toyota, yeah. when we were with the Oriol in New Zealand, <coughs> 1998, I think the famous year, the famous 98, and I think we were in the valley, and um, we were battling, both of us, and it was a Wanga Coast, the stage we mentioned before, and yeah. Teutewai, another short stage right after was the last stage of the rally. And the team order from Ove Anderson, before Wanga Coast, said to both of us, and that was quite risky from him, but he said, guys, you are fighting now, Come on, fight on the next stage. Fastest on the next stage wins the rally. Okay. So we beat the by three seconds, I think it was, and then the rally was decided, and then the last stage we just cruised to the end. But Tove Anderson was very brave saying, but yeah. that's quite, uh, they said, whoever the wins the longest yeah. stage yeah. between you two, the fastest between you two, will win the rally. Okay, yeah. that's amazing. Speaking of winning rallies, you remember Acropolis when we were talking about that with your bonnet up? Yeah, of course, yeah. I remember the first rally <laughs> I won, but I think yeah. it's probably to that bonnet and everything, there was a long story already before, I start uh, probably roughly one year before when uh, we were actually the same team, uh, and I was leading the rally already by one minute and half a point, but then I unfortunately had a puncture and we, we lost a lot of time and, uh, and ended up, I don't know, fifth or sixth or something like that, uh, but then you know, that was a really first time when I had a chance to, to, to win. But after that, when we got the new mm -hmm. car in 2003, there was already a few rallies at the beginning of that car that were looking uh, good to mm -hmm. win the event. And there was always some technical uh, problem um, stopped us, uh, yeah. at least fighting for the win <coughs> or, or, or really, you know. It was uh, really difficult to, 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 to take uh, as, as a young driver because you want to win your first uh, event to, to prove yourself that you can do it and then always oh, something missing, something missing. <laughs> yeah. So it, it was a bit of a, you know, uh, the excitement, you was, getting out your grasp, the, yeah, the yeah. excitement was getting higher and higher that like, what, what do we need to do to actually win an event? And then we came back to the Acropolis and and uh, again, we were doing really great from the start, and we had a uh, lead, I think, at that point. And then we came to the back to the same long stage. I don't remember the name of the stage, but it, the, the year before we had a puncture there. And that, that year, um, it was probably like a 30 kilometer stage, yeah. and then on 10 kilometers, it just went through the tip, and the, the bonnet went up. And it was not uh, like uh, somebody had left it open or anything. It was. Just it's a bit of a it's the broken the pins, not it? The yeah, it's like a bit of a design fault actually, yeah. I think. Uh, yeah. And then the how far from the end of the stage do you remember? It was like a 20k to, to yeah. the end. 20k um, to the end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But the, the thing was, uh, while we think that there's a long story before, that I don't think that for a moment I, I thought about stopping because I, I had so much uh, sort of 
pressure myself I wanted to win a rally I'm think I was yeah. thinking that this botnet is not going to stop me winning that <laughs> rally you know it's uh, okay it's another bump on the road but uh, we will try to do as well as possible okay I'm normally <coughs> I'm sitting very low in a car and uh, I, I could see through it quite okay but uh, imagine if you go high speed and you need to see the long distance yeah. then you don't see the distance you see like I don't know 50 meters uh, 100 meters uh, in front but you don't see further and you don't have any visibility around so you're just looking from the tank uh, window you know. uh, it's quite uh, difficult to drive like that uh, but I think we managed uh, really okay and uh, I think at the end we were like uh, I don't know, five six seconds uh, away from the fastest time to yeah. 20 kilometers like that and I think the visibility wasn't the main thing uh, the main thing was um, the heat because the uh, roof end was blocked with a bonnet so uh, and the yeah, trees you don't get any, inside any, yeah. any ventilation in a, in a car uh, I, I was really losing uh, my uh, patience <laughs> yeah. uh, towards the end of the stage people had to tell me like come on it's only three k's to go or something like that yeah. or two k's to go like uh, because I, I started to really oh. sort of not not really concentrate anymore and so I we, we, we didn't believe you when you came on the radio and said the bonnet had blown up at 20 k's we looked at the stage time. <laughs> no, 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 no. It, it, it yeah. flown up near the end. Yeah, well, it must have uh, just flown up uh, yeah. off or something like that. Honestly, we didn't believe it. But luckily, you didn't stop because what Johnny's saying yeah. that the pins were broken. If yeah. you stop, you can repair it anyway. Yeah, yeah. So you lose the rally. Well, but uh, as I was saying, that there was not one uh, discussion even should we stop it. Was yeah. Like we continue <laughs> like this. We'll start, never mind the bonnet like this and bonnet yeah. like that. So it's. Um, it's only when we started getting the photos and the TV crews kept coming back and it was incredible and that's when we we saw the pictures I mean it, it was just uh, ter sort of I was determined to yeah to, to win the rally you know, it didn't matter with a bonnet with the well, wheels with shows a how motivated you were yeah, to, to, just to win it normally yeah. you, you should not be able to do that you know even think about the aerodynamics of the car you know you have a bonnet like that you know no, no, yeah. no. everybody has tried to engineer some special small things and then you have a bonnet like that and <laughs> yeah. you, you are fi you know, really fast on the stage you know, it shouldn't be like that yeah. <laughs> but um yeah no, it was it was quite an amazing uh, stage to do but uh, the main thing was we really wanted to win and uh, at the end we got the win and i think it was yeah. great for the team that time as well because uh, the decision was taken to to chop the old superstars and go with the young uh, <laughs> guys that year and that was the first uh, time to, to prove yeah. that it was the right decision and that it worked so. but also that was the first car that Christian L'Oreal had designed mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. remember he was at Subaru when you were yep, there yep. and that was his first car uh, because he wasn't involved in the first focus so I had all the tweaks and stuff yeah, I mean we, we came with Christian same time from uh, ProDrive uh, yeah. to try when as an as engineer so I think we worked quite quite well together. Even the 2002, we didn't have so much chance to change the car, but uh, throughout the year there were some changes, and yeah. I, I think I, I coped a little bit better uh, with those changes than the Colin and Carlos because at the end of the year I was able to compete quite well with them, uh, and I was just probably like a new generation taking uh, the new new directions yeah. directions easier than uh, the old guys. Even though I think Carlos uh, was more able to, to change than Colin. Colin always used to drive his own style and like he did yeah. in 92 he kept on that the same style all the time but I think Carlos was clever enough to, to go with the times and uh, <laughs> change yeah. his approach yeah. and uh, way of driving so but the new car was definitely uh, <coughs> set to the, to well, the direction of yeah. where the cars are at the moment I think so it was definitely a change of Christian was, and he's a very, very good engineer. He was a pro driver, pro -rife. He was yeah. only in charge of suspension, but then when he went to M Sport, he became like a he leader. Yeah, like a uh, leader of the yeah. 2000 Subaru was made made more or less by him as well, which was a lot faster than everything else. Yeah, but it didn't really have the reliability, so it was no. always uh, having some problems. But it was fast car. I think that was his first like, big project and. But of course, in Ford, he, he got all the yeah. glory with it as well. Well, they got the clean sheet of paper, yeah. and uh, off he went with it. So, 
No, it was good. Right, so it was a fantastic car today to drive. Yeah. And when you were saying that you were driving very low in the car, I remember you and Richard Barnes as well. He used to sit very low in the car. Yeah, yeah. Really low. I'm sure when people see you on the street, because it happens to me, you know, co drivers are sitting very low. And then when they see me, Luis, we never thought you were so tall. <laughs> no, because in the car, and then same with you, because you yeah. and Richard, Richard was also maybe yeah. not as tall as you, but I very tall. Well, tall yeah. And Richard told me once that he said, Luis, sometimes I see the road from under the steering wheel. Yeah. You yeah, know, I mean, it was so low, yeah. he said, I feel uh, more the car I mean, on my... One, one time I had a um, quite embarrassing moment with that uh, in Australia. I was sitting so low, and the, the road went uh, slightly over the hill, and there was a junction to the right. And uh, when we were going up, I couldn't really see the road, <laughs> but I so, uh, saw there was a cap between the trees. Yeah. So I thought there must be the junction. I turned there, and then the moment we turned there, I could see, oh, fuck, it's a <laughs> car park. <laughs> it's not, <laughs> not the road, so I had the handbrake come back, and yeah. then uh, 20 <laughs> meters later was the junction. So but no, I just couldn't see the place uh, where it was. So it, sometimes it was a bit uh, on a limit. But that was another Christian idea, wasn't it? Was to get everything down. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's the, same, yeah, the same principle everybody you know, uh, continue using. That yeah. you, know, you have to have a low center of gravity in a car. And, yeah, uh, you don't have to. And uh, you know, it's you can put the co-driver's uh, map light, you know, ten centimeters lower yeah. and higher. It's like twenty, uh, like two hundred grams or something like that. But if you put like seventy or eighty kilos. Yeah, uh, higher or lower, it's a big thing. Because we started that right, we started with you in the year 2000, and the first thing we did in Spain, in this, when they put the seat of the co driver completely in the bottom, yeah, right, not so small, in 180, just over 180, and I sat in the car, I couldn't see anything. So then eventually, I started to put cushions under my seat, yeah. you know, and I need to go up. <laughs> and then I don't know if it was Christian who came, Luis, this is not the philosophy. <laughs> you have to go, but I can't see what well, you have to get used to. Yeah, yeah, and then yeah, eventually, yeah. Okay, you start to drive and you start to read the notes on a different way because you, know, you start to follow more trees and other things because in the, before yeah. you know you could see everything we were sitting and also on safety you know yeah. it's much better to be low yeah. much much better but we were sitting so high that I could see everything and then eventually and I can see you know the small co-drivers they don't see anything at all yeah. mm -hmm. and I did um, I did the Malcolm Wilson stages with Malcolm in the Super 2000 that uh, Miko used on the Monte so Yamo is quite a big guy so I sat in the seat and literally looking, I could see underneath the heater motor, and that was it. No, no. And obviously we were on strange page notes, etc. And all I could do was keep looking up at Malcolm, <laughs> saying, "I hope these are reading right," because you, you couldn't see it. No, no, no. And I sort of said to him, "When we get to service, I'm going to have to get a cushion because I didn't even on the road section. You couldn't even find a junction. <laughs> you know, you're that low down." <laughs> But sorry, speaking of Monte, I'll just tell you a little trick we did once. Um, we did Monte Carlo with Miko in um, the Super 2000 when it first came out. And it wasn't the World Championship event, it was the mm. European Championship event. And we were on Pirelli's and everybody else, Citroën, with Ogier, etc., were all on Michelin. And it got to the last night and we were servicing down in Monaco, we were on the seafront there servicing. We had the last two stages to go, over the top of Turini and then soft bell. We'd no weather crews or all that, that with real low budget operation. So we'd run the guy in the hotel at the top, the free The travelling. That's it. The travelling. On the top of the pole. Yes, it's snowing, right. So that means we're going to need studs to get over the top of Turini, but the rest of it is going to be dry tarmac. And of course, we got all the guys watching us, what tyres we're putting on, because we were first car on the road. So we thought, right, well, the ideal choice is like an intermediate tyre, but studs is the option. So George Black gets his white marker pen out that he writes on the side of the tyres what the driver's name is, and starts putting dots on in his white pen across the tyre, so it looks at the distance like studs. So we brought these tyres out, and of course the, the car gets too close to you it's at night, they're all with the torches looking, put these on the car, all disappears off to put their tyres on, Roger, etc. all put studs on, because they thought we'd done the same. Pulls out, goes to the refuel, and um, Seb comes up to Miko's car, rubs his hands on the tyre, says, where's your studs gone? He says, we haven't put studs on. He says, yes you have, he says, we saw you putting studs on. No we didn't straight on the telephone to his guy and mysteriously his power steering broke before he got to Turini so we never found out if it was actually had there been an advantage yeah, or not. Mm. But in the meantime Mark was getting all these phone calls from Finland
from everybody in Finland ringing up and saying, you've blown his chances, why have you put him on stud? You should have put him on slicks and all that. And said, yeah, we did, we did. No, no, you didn't. We put him on stud, we got the force exact. And it was all because George Black had put white dots yeah. <laughs> on the tyres. And it was a trick and it worked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. Plenty of tricks. Now they, but everything is so close and so tight, it's quite difficult. To, yeah. Quite difficult to do. Some people we used to put tires next to the car, pretending they were going to put this on the last minute, change to another one. Yeah, it was even difficult to choose a tire yeah. anyway because you had like different construction, different compounds, different That's thread true. patterns, yeah. everything. Like uh, now, for example, in Monte Carlo this year, just a, a round figure. Eh? In Monte Carlo this year, we have 300 tires, 100 per car. No, three car team, we have yeah. 300 tires. In 1990, when we were with three car team with Toyota. You are Cancun and beyond Valdez. And ourselves, Pirelli brought 3,000, 1,000 per car. Yeah. Because the, 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 our, now the rally is a service park, so you always come back to the same place, and you have everything in the same place. Yeah. But before the rally, as you know, was linear, so we need to have everything mm. everywhere. All the choices everywhere. And because we yeah. had a narrow study tire, intermediate and wide, with the studs outside, inside, yeah. outside. Yeah. No? Yeah. And it was a nightmare to yeah. choose tires, it was a real nightmare. Yeah. Because you had so many options, we have like 12 or 14 options per stage, and sometimes you doubt between four or five, and it was and difficult to take a decision. And then the testing with us, just to, you know, to yeah. find yeah. out which tire works where. Yeah, you have to go through to try and work out the distance. <laughs> with a memory, you had a nice you know, crew per stage, hmm. and that crew yeah, just yeah, did that yeah. stage up yeah. and down, up and down, up and down, and then you had a different ice note crew for the next stage, and a different one for the next stage, and this is what everybody says: the good old days. They weren't good, they were just old. No, yeah, they were different. Yeah, different they, were, yeah. they were different. I mean, the sport is a lovely sport. I mean, we love the sport. And I mean, to all three of us, it gave us everything we have in our lives. And we yeah. got paid to work in what we like. You know, what more can we ask for? I mean, for me, it's uh, like I always yeah. say in Volkswagen, you know, why I'm starting German now? Because Volkswagen gave me an unique opportunity to give back to running what running gave me. Running gave me everything mm -hmm. in my life, a comfortable life for me, for my family. And Volkswagen and just asked me, Luis, speak about it. Yeah. That's all I have to do. A lot of uh, different friends all over the world, you know, yeah, people true. you would never know. Yeah. It was nice to come here because I knew Lewis will do all the, uh, all the talking, talking and, uh, yeah. and <laughs> listen, sit here and listen to uh, all the nice stories. Yeah, all the interesting stories coming out, yeah. Like the dance at the end of Indonesia, for example. Oh, that right. used to be Giving. common at the end of it. But yeah. before I could dance and I could make a mess everywhere because there were no mobile phones, there were no cameras, nobody ah. would film you. So only people around you would know. Because <coughs> I remember going to in Indonesia and we won the rally there. Yeah. And the, 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 the waiters, the waiter of the, the restaurant was carrying a, a jacket like a clown, you know, with dots and this. So I had my blazer and I just wore blazer. And I put it on and I started to dance on the table. I don't know, I don't know. It ended up like a little bit of a mess. But in those days you could do things like that because yeah. it would not be recorded. Yeah. But now you have to be very careful. Everything right. goes in internet, YouTube, in immediately, in yeah. one minute. <coughs> yeah, but don't worry, Luis. Now that people want themselves to, to have that <laughs> information out there uh, on the internet, I think. Uh, yeah. That's the difference. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's what happens to me when they do the prize giving, starting off with the guy who finished last. No. By the time it got to you guys at the front, you had that much to drink. <laughs> oh, <laughs> and, did, did, did and I remember in Indonesia, <laughs> yeah. we got to the end of one of the legs, we were leading the rally. <coughs> and we get to the end, and the podium, at the end of the day, we have to go through the podium, we was in the parking of the hotel. And our rooms were facing the parking. And there was a guy with a loudspeaker yeah. making an incredible noise. And then Carlos phoned me and said, Luis, I can't sleep, it's very noisy. Carlos, don't worry, we'll sort it out. So I phoned the hotel manager and said, excuse me, can you please tell the guy outside? No, I phoned the organizers, nobody would do anything. Carlos told me, do this, I cannot sleep. I said, Carlos, don't worry, he told me I will sort it out, and I will sort it out. So then I dress up myself, and I went down, and I went yeah. behind the speakers, and I just broke all the wires. <laughs> <laughs> and then, but I made sure that I broke them, because he said, I, they cannot repair it now, it's a night, so I, I cannot just undo it. So I just went behind, and looked, nobody saw me, and I, boom, broke them all. And then I went, went to sleep, and the following morning, Carlos asked me, oh, Luis, this is you managed to sort out. Yeah, 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 I sorted it out, oh, no problem. How do you do it? I just broke it, Carlos. <laughs> Sorry? Just wrote the wire. Why? You wrote the wire. Carol, you told me you couldn't sleep. Did you sleep? Yeah. Well, then <laughs> there, you are, there you go. You see? Easy. I told you I find a solution. And you know, yeah. I find a solution for everything.